Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And today we've got another amazing story coming to us from the U.S. We have an old hero of mine. His name is Robert Luca. Robert Luca was born in Meriden, Connecticut in 1939 and graduated from Meriden High School in 1957. He spent most of his teen to mid-20s building hot rods and street racing. He loved all things electromechanical and started working at a car repair shop at the age of 16. As the years progressed, he worked at car dealerships in the following positions, technician, service writer, parts manager, service manager, and service director. His first UFO encounter happened in Meriden in 1944 at the age of five. He had a UFO abduction experience in 1967 while driving alone on the way to the beach. Robert met Betty Andreessen under very unusual circumstances in 1977 while on vacation in Florida. They both got married in, in August of 1978 and purchased a home in Meriden. While living in this house, they were abducted together and also had many unexplained phenomena while living there. Surveillance from the air by helicopter started while living in this house at the time the Andreessen Affair book was submitted for publication. In 1980, they moved to a new home in Cheshire, Connecticut. After the book was published, the government surveillance got much more intense. In 1982, they were the first to interview Larry Warren, who broke the story on the landing of a UFO outside of Bent Waters Air Force Base, resulting in an increase in the level of surveillance by government and military agencies. At the time, the government harassment was quite extreme, to the point that their Cheshire home was broken into, and for whatever reason, they were drugged in their own home. From 1995 to 2000, they had some strange UFO-related phenomena take place, but government harassment seemed to be minimal. Eventually, his computer got hacked by the Department of Defense while living in Florida. In 2004, Robert retires and moves to his new home in Virginia, where he has had much unusual paranormal activity. Now, as far as he knows, there is no more government interest in him, and continues to research the UFO phenomena and can only hope that real disclosure will take place in the near future, although he doubts it will happen anytime soon, as it would be too costly for large corporations and the elite to control Earth's finances and population. The Lucas are the subjects of six books, The Andreessen Affair, The Andreessen Affair Phase Two, The Watchers, The Watchers Two, The Andreessen Legacy, and A Lifting the Veil, all of which can be purchased on Amazon. So Robert, thank you so much for coming on. Well, my pleasure. I thank you for having me. Um, Rob, can you get into your story? Uh, let's start off uh, when you were a child. Uh, at what age did everything start for you? Oh, okay. Well, the first thing, when and, uh, I was just a, a, a kid in 1944 uh, during the war. Uh, my dad was overseas, and my mom and I were living with my grandmother. And my uncles had set up a swing set in the backyard for me, which I used quite often. You know, my life was pretty much normal outside of my dad being gone. Well, one day I was sitting on the swings and it was this bright uh, silver light in the sky and it approached from the west and it came very close and came down low and it stopped over. We all, everybody had a victory garden back then. Well, this thing stopped to the left of my swing set, which was our victory garden. And it, it, it beamed a very thin um, white light, which hit me right between the eyes. Uh, pencil is, is about as thick as a pencil lead. And I could see when the thing tipped, there were two little, what I called then little people inside, and they looked like the typical gray today. And I was told that they were preparing something for mankind that would be good in the future. And they said that people like me and many others they had visited would not be frightened when they see them in the future. And that people that had seen them from all over the world would eventually meet each other. And, you know, in my case and with my wife, I mean, that's true. We've met many other people that have had abduction experiences. So what they told me was correct. That was the very first time. And yet, you know, the funny thing is they put it in my head 
I couldn't tell my mother and, and uh, grandmother, I couldn't tell anybody what, uh, they just put it in my head. You don't tell anybody what you witnessed or saw. And I never did in for, for about 60 years. Did you get into the 1967 event? All right. And this is interesting because Betty had an encounter in 1944. She, I was five. She was seven. In 1967, she had an encounter in January, and I had one in the, in the, during, in the summer, same year. Uh, at that time, I was on my way to the beach. It was a beautiful, sunny day. And I got in an area known as uh, the, the New Haven uh, Trap Rock. And as I crossed the railroad tracks, there was a spur that went into the uh, quarry. And there were five men working on that track, but they weren't working. They were all looking up, pointing at something up in the air. So, of course, I looked to see what they were pointing at. And there were two huge cigar-shaped craft. Um, it was obvious they weren't airplanes because they had no wings, no tail section. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely silent. And um, they looked like the sun shining off a of polished chrome. They're very, very bright. Well, I pulled over to the side of the road because I wanted to get a better look. I thought this was amazing. Meanwhile, two smaller discs dropped out one out of each one of those huge cigar shaped craft. One went uh, toward New Haven, one went in the opposite direction. Well, I watched till they were out of sight and I thought, oh my God, that, wow, what is that? Well, I got a little further down the road and this is a real, at that time, a very rural area. There weren't any houses in that area or whatnot. And all of a sudden, one of the smaller round ones came back and it started settling down kind of like a leaf falling rocking from side to side and it got about five or six feet off the ground and it just stopped and it was next to right next to uh, the, the road well all of a sudden i saw a flash a bright flash of uh very deep red almost like a ruby red laser light and the next thing I knew, I was inside that craft. Well, inside there were five grays. And what struck me is they all looked like they came out of the same mold. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't tell one from the other. And I was told to remove my clothing. And at this time, I was pretty well shook up. This was a very odd situation. So I did, and I was put on a table, and for lack of a better word, I was given some type of physical examination. Um, once I got on that table, there were no, uh, no restraints, but I could not move. It was like almost like somebody put super glue on my back. I could move my head a bit. And, and look around a little bit, but they they uh, examined um, all my joints and they moved my head back and forth, my fingers. They took um, they took skin samples. They took samples even of my toenails, and then unfortunately they took sperm samples as well. And it it wasn't pleasant like when you have sex, it, it, not pleasant at all. And then the last thing, they had this uh, unit came out of the ceiling, which is, I can only equate it to like a modern x-ray machine. And it, it gave off a pinkish white light and it went back and forth, back and forth several times from head to toe over my body. And uh, that was the last thing. And then somehow I got back in my car. Apparently, they put me back, but I had no memory of it until when I got to the beach. I should have been there in about 30, 40 minutes from, the, from where I was. 
and about two and a half to three hours had passed because when I got to the beach, I was hungry again. And when I went in a restaurant and noticed the time, I never knew for years what what happened. Where'd that time go? You know, I, it should have taken me 30 minutes, not two and a half hours or more. And that and when the rest of that came out, when finally when I got hypnosis, but that was like 10 years later. And the thing is, I couldn't talk. Well, this was in the 60s and I couldn't talk to anybody about it. I kept it inside for years because uh, I, I did tell my parents and my very best friend who was a police officer and nobody else. Uh, I was afraid I'd get you know, put in a loony bin for examination or something like that. So I never talked about it after. And uh, the interesting thing is Betty was abducted in 1967 also in uh, her home in, in Massachusetts. And we didn't know each other. I never knew Betty until uh, I met her in Florida. So what happened to her during that event? Well... In 1967, um, her whole family was home. Her mother and father were staying with her because her her ex her husband then had been in a car accident and he was in the hospital. So the mother and father were helping her because Betty had seven children. And uh, all of a sudden, they saw this reddish orange light flashing outside the window of the house. So logically, they thought, well, it's got to be a fire department or a police department or something like that. So her father was the first one to see. He rushed down toward the back window and he, he looked out the window and he saw these little, he didn't know what they were. He thought he called them Halloween freaks. And they, were, he, they weren't walking. They were kind of hopping toward the house. Well, when they got to the house, they just came in right through the door. Never, never opened the door, just came in right through it. And Betty, because of her uh, religious background or spiritual background, she thought, well, with those kind of abilities, they must be angels. And um, so she asked them what they wanted. And they said they wanted knowledge tried by fire. So she thought they meant that they wanted something to eat. And she started to actually cook some meat for them. And they said, no, we want knowledge tried by fire. So she gave them a Bible. And she handed the, the first one a Bible. And he passed his hand over it and made four more for the rest of them. And they looked at it without touching it. The pages would flip one after another after another. And her family, meantime, was put into a state of suspended animation because her mother and all her seven kids and her father was there. So she said they looked like they were just frozen in time. And at that time, that's when they took her out of the house into their craft. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, I, there is a picture that shows her about halfway through the door. She got in line behind them, and she said she just passed right through the door. And I, I don't know if it's because they're able to change your vibratory rate or frequency or what. I don't know how they do it, but they've done it <laughs> many, many times. And they took her out to the back where their craft was on a slight hill in the back of the house. And the leader, again, rose his hand, raised his hand and waved it over the craft, and the bottom of it became transparent, so she could actually see the workings inside the bottom of the craft. And from that point, she was taken into the craft. Um, she was examined, and then she was taken to a number of places, which I, I can't describe them all because I need the book myself because her she had so many experiences that were so complicated that I don't want to mess up on what actually happened. But um, 
the 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 basic message of everything that happened to her the being said that man was advancing uh too rapidly with technology and too slowly spiritually they said that uh it's better to lose some than all to which i don't know that something might be coming um and they said that they love mankind and they wanted to help and that they replenish and by that what they meant is she was on a huge craft another time and there was a lake in the craft and, and they stopped over a lake on earth opened the bottom and tons and tons of water and fish fell into the uh, lake below so apparently that's what they mean by replenish. Um, and at one time she was taken to see the one. She was told not many people had gotten as far as her. And the one was in an, an area of just light, pure, pure white light. And she could not see the one, but she heard him. He conversed with her. And apparently the reason for her abductions back then was to let people know that these things were real and that they were happening um, because she, Betty was so honest and, and loyal and her, she was just highly credible. And after this experience, uh, when they did the hypnosis for her, they had a, a psychiatric evaluation. They had lie detector tests. They had uh, people from the scientific and military community were all involved in the investigation. And at the time when the UFO was behind her house, there was a power failure in the neighborhood and the power company could not explain it. That was all checked by the investigators. So that first one was, uh, I guess, uh, quite an eye opener for everybody. She she didn't believe in UFOs and she had no uh, no knowledge of UFOs at that time at all. She, you know, she was she was a mother with seven kids and she didn't have time to, you know, <laughs> look at UFO books or anything like that. So that's why they they found her to be quite credible with everything she came out with. And then later on, it proved out to be true, which we'll get into, uh, you know, a little later on down the road. She was visited. We, we, we were in a campground because we um, we had purchased a 30 foot trailer. And for a few years, we lived in Connecticut in the summer and then. We lived in Florida in the winter, which was really nice. I kind of liked that lifestyle. Well, she was alone in the trailer, and this being showed up and was questioning her and giving her information. But here's why he did that. He took out something from a little pouch, and he sprinkled it in the air. It was all like little uh, sparkly things. And he said, there are too many ears. In other words, people or somebody, government probably, listening. So the very interesting thing about that, when I got home that day, she told me what happened. And being a technician, I noticed there was an odor in that trailer that was very familiar. It was, it was burnt insulation on wiring. And I said, well, wait a minute. So we had a water pump in that uh in that camp trailer but we did not use it because we were on the camp's water so i taped the water pump in the off position so no one would accidentally turn it on well it turns out that the wiring going to that pump literally the, the insulation melted okay so that had to be some kind of an effect of what that being sprinkled around or or whatever and there was another thing the there were a number of uh, oak trees all surrounding the area we were in but the ones right behind the camper the top of the leaves turned brown but the bottom was still green and the only people we could get at the time we got two uh, electrical engineers to come and look and, and you know, and get their opinion. 
And they thought it was some kind of EMP, some kind of electromagnetic pulse that, that could have caused that. So that, that made a lot of sense, but it's not really answers, you know. Uh, I would love to somebody say, well, this happened because, and come out with direct answers, but that doesn't happen with this phenomena. You get more questions than answers as things go by. So everything was unusual, including how I met Betty. Um, for a long time, I was a very conscientious worker. I'd never taken off like more than two weeks from my job, you know, for vacation. And I had a friend in Connecticut that was a, a painting contractor. And he and I were good friends. We'd hunt together. We'd fish together, stuff like that. And he said, one day we were talking, he said, you know, Bob, he says, work is getting a little slow here. He says, I'd like to take a look around the country and see if things are any better elsewhere. So he said, I'd like to take a month, go around the country, he says, and, you know, maybe see if the employment situation is any better. So I said, wow, a month. Uh, yeah. He says, I, he says, uh, you, you're going to go with me, aren't you? I said, take a month off from work? Oh, I don't think so. But I had this weird feeling like I should do it. And that was very unusual. I felt compelled, put it that way, to go. So I went into my boss and I told him, I said, I need a month off. And he said, no, no, no. He said, we, no, I can't give you that much time off because um, I was running the service department and it, it was busy and I was pretty good at what I did. I was making him quite a bit of money. So well, <laughs> that's obviously the reason he didn't want me to go for too long. <laughs> but anyway, I thought about it over the weekend. And like I said, I just felt compelled to, to, to do this, to go. So I came in on Monday and I, his name was Bob too. I said, Bob, I said, you know, I said, I can quit, you can fire me, or you can let me go, but I'm going on that trip. So he was not happy, but he decided to just let me take the month off. So uh, I had a camp trailer at the time. So Eddie and I packed that up with food and supplies and all that kind of good stuff. And we set out, we went all over the country. I mean, we were um california we we're out in oregon we we're in ohio we we're in louisiana um and we had a little time left we we're coming back and we were parked i think in idaho with a rest area and i said eddie, eddie and i neither one of us like cold he says darn he says you know he says we got a little time left he says let's go to florida well okay sounds good to me well, we went to Florida, and Eddie had a sister-in-law that lived there, and she was so nice. Her name was Catherine. She said, boy, you park your trailer on my property, and you can stay right here. I, I said, great. We didn't need to get a campground or anything. Well, she was a cook at a restaurant in, Flor in Pompano Beach, Florida, called The Clock, and uh Oh, she prepared some great meals for us. Uh, she fed us very well. But one night we were having supper and the converse, the topic of UFOs came up in the conversation because there's been a, a sightings nearby recently. And she says, oh, she said, I work with a woman um, that has had some kind of UFO uh, experience. And boy, I perked right up. I said, so Really? And she said, yeah, she says she's had a, some kind of experience actually with the actual UFOs. Well, like I told you, I never told anybody of my experience for 10 years at that time. And I thought, geez, maybe this is a woman I could talk to that, you know, she might not think I'm nuts. And uh, so I asked Catherine, I said, well, when does she work and what does she look like? So she told me where to, uh, when she'd be on at the restaurant and all. And a day later, 
when during her shift, I went down to the restaurant and I introduced myself and she wouldn't talk to me <laughs> because uh, Ray Fowler, the author of the book, that he was working on the book at that time. And he said, he told her, he says, well, you don't, you don't talk to any reporters. She, he said, I don't want you saying a peep about any of this. Well, I guess at the time I was like 38 years old and I guess I looked like a reporter to her and she absolutely would not give me the time of day. She would tell, oh, I'm busy, you know, I'm working. And all. So finally I, I'm trying to turn on a little bit of charm the best I could. And I said, well, well, well how about a date tomorrow for lunch? So the next day um, I, I picked her up and her she was living with her sister because uh she had a big house in Massachusetts, but her sister kept telling her why go through the tough winters up there and all that. So she was trying to buy a place in Florida. That's why she was with her sister. So I picked her up and we went out to lunch and I, I finally convinced her, hey, I am not a reporter and and uh uh, she started to loosen up a little bit. We started to talk, and I I told her about my whole experience, and um, she listened. And she didn't make fun or anything. And I thought, boy, this is, you know, this is kind of nice to get it off my chest with somebody that's not going to be ridiculing me or you know anything like that. But in the meantime, you know, I was a single guy, and I was noticing. I said, gee, this. To myself, I'm saying, you know, this, this lady's kind of attractive. I, I think I kind of like her. So I took a shot. I said, well, maybe tomorrow um, could I take you out to lunch again? Well, next day rolled around. I took her out to lunch. And I was buying that lunch for 44 years after that. <laughs> she, uh, a year later, uh, yeah, a good year later, uh, is when we were married, but it, she was the one that made me feel much more at ease about being able to talk about it. And she got a hold of the investigators so that they could uh, do some hypnosis on me and and whatnot to see the things that had happened. And uh, I, well, I don't know how to give her credit, but she changed my life totally. Uh, I don't usually, I didn't admit this never in the past, but up until that point in my life, I wasn't a real good guy. Um, I, I did a lot of the street racing up until I was almost that age. And the problem I had then was I liked the ladies too much. I had problems with ex-husbands, with boyfriends, all which I bought upon myself. But once I, I, Betty was just so pure and innocent. Um, I, I, I seeing the way she lived, I thought, you know, I, I, w I would like my life like that. But she didn't have any problems because I finally figured out after being with her that I was making my problems <laughs> and nobody else. So um, I, I just became so involved with her and and so I, I fell in love with her while we were dating in florida because i don't usually go around singing or anything and i kept singing this song when i was with her from a jack to a king from loneliness to a wedding ring and i didn't even know the significance at the time <laughs> so that's how uh you know i finally got up the nerve asked her to marry me about a year later and we were married, and after that, there was many, many things happened. And I used to kid her. I said, you know, I said, if I knew how much baggage you were bringing with you into this relationship, I probably wouldn't have asked you to marry me. <laughs> she used to get all irritated at that. But once the two of us were together, and once the uh, the book was ready to be published, that's when we started, or they, the government, started their surveillance. We lived at a, a house on Draper Avenue in Meriden, Connecticut. And we're noticing these black helicopters. It, 
They didn't have any markings on them. They didn't have any tail numbers on them. Um, and they were flying over very frequently. In fact, sometimes so low, the windows in the house would rattle. And the lady that lived next door to us, who turned out to be a city councilwoman, was so concerned, she started documenting the times and dates that they were coming over. Well, I contacted Ray Fowler and I told him, you know, how we were having these weird helicopter flights. And he said, oh, you're probably just in a, in a uh, flight path or something like that. I thought, OK, so we didn't pay too much attention. Um, I did photograph uh, quite a few of them, but never thought too much of it. Well, then a year or so later, uh, we found a house that we, we really liked in Cheshire, Connecticut. And we were able to purchase that house and sell the one in Meriden. And this is when a, the stuff really started. The first day we were at the attorney's for the closing. And we had the, the two girls and we told them we got them started in school in Cheshire. And we told them when you get out of school, go right directly to the new house and we'll be there as soon as we get out of the clo uh, closing. Well, the house was locked up and we didn't have the keys. So we were still at the closing and the girls uh, came in, got out of school, went to the house and the doors were open and somebody was inside. So the girls asked them, who are you? And they, they said, oh, telephone company. And uh, as far as I know, they got no reason to go inside the house to hook up your phone. So apparently, uh, I think at the time, what they would, I think they were bugging the house. Um, and that seemed to prove out later on. Well, okay, so we finally moved into that house. And now the helicopters are over that house. And sometimes four or five times a week, sometimes low enough, without exaggerating, had I a baseball or a rock, at times I could have hit them. That's how low they were. And they came over directly over the house. Now, at the time, I was taking lessons for my pilot's license. And FAA regulations prevent them from doing that. FAA regulations say they have to be 500 feet laterally from any buildings. And they weren't. They were right over the top of our house. I mean, you know. Um, so what I did, I started taking a lot of photos. And I got the approximate compass setting, the altitude, time of day. And I started looking for the owners. I wrote the military. I wrote the FBI. I wrote the Pilot Owners Association. Uh, I wrote Bell Helicopter in Texas. I uh, wrote the National Guard, uh, the Army. Strangely enough, nobody knew whose helicopters these were. So I finally contacted the Federal Aviation, uh, General Aviation District Office in Boston, because that where we were, that came under their jurisdiction. And I sent them pictures and all, and they said, well, they said, they wrote me back. They said, well, there's no, no tail numbers, uh, no ID numbers on these helicopters. I said, I know that. That's why I wrote you. <laughs> so uh, one fellow was so interested. He told me on the phone, he said, this sounds like a CIA operation to me. And I said, well, I don't think the CIA has got any interest in us, but maybe there's something going around near us or whatever but he came down to our home all the way from boston on a saturday and unfortunately we weren't home but later on much later on connecticut magazine did an article on my wife and i and they looked up various people you know that we had mentioned and when they contacted him Oh, no, he says, I, I think that it was just a play on light. Uh, uh, I don't remember anything about that. Well, the dummy left a note on my door, which I saved. So, you know, 
and, and then when I called back, by the way, I called the FAA uh, that next, I think Monday or Tuesday, and they told me he had been transferred. So I said, well, where is he transferred to? And they couldn't tell me that. And this happened a couple more times with different people like the police and stuff like that. So as if the helicopters weren't enough, we started being followed by cars. So as I said, I did a lot of street racing. And a few times I got behind the cars that were following us and I got the license plates and I gave them to uh, police lieutenant Larry Fawcett, who was also a UFO investigator. And he ran the plates. And it turns out that the plates were not issued. So who has access to plates that aren't issued? The alphabet agencies, the CIA, FBI, you know, whatever. And also, if that wasn't enough, the IRS decided that every year for four years, they were going to help us with our taxes. <laughs> so we had an audit every year for four years until I started the last time. I just overpaid my taxes. And then I, on purpose, not by much, but then we didn't get an audit. And at the, at the first audit, now remember, this is the IRS. At the first audit, they wanted to know, what did you see? What did the beings look like? What kind of craft was it? Very unusual questions for the IRS. Okay. So uh, they, then uh, we found our telephone was tapped. That was verified by Larry Fawcett. As well as myself, we had in those days that you could they you could purchase an electronic tap detector, which today you can't because their technology is more sophisticated and cell phones and whatnot, so you really can't tell. But it did show a tap on our home phone, and there were times when we, you could hear somebody else on the phone, and it wasn't us. So I called the phone company, and I told them I said I I suspect our telephone is tapped and i said i'd like that checked well the government has a long reach apparently they sent this fella down to the house and he knocks on the door told me he was from the phone company so i told him what was going on he this is god's honest truth he goes over to the telephone and he tries to take off the mouthpiece and he says, oh, no, he said, this is tight. He says, nobody's been in there. I said, what? He says, no, nah, nobody's been in there. And so finally he's leaving. He says, we'll check your lines, too. And the guy got about 10 feet out the door. And I said, I told Betty, I said, watch this. And I just grabbed the phone and unscrewed the mouthpiece. So he, you know, he apparently somebody told him not to find anything wrong. Uh, and of course. He didn't, but um, they, the amount of surveillance after, uh, it was pretty bad then, but then in, in 1982, a young fella called me at work. His name was Larry, uh, Larry Warren, and he saw an article in the newspaper about Betty and I, so he called me at my job. And he says, Bob, he says, I, he says, I was in the military and the air force. He said, I had a, a UFO experience while there. And he says, I'd like to talk about it. Well, first off, he had just had oral surgery and he sounded something like Donald Duck. And I'm thinking, oh no, because you know, we've been pranked a couple of times. That's normal. You got to expect it. They'd call the dealership and ask if we had any used UFOs. You know, people that are, <laughs> well, just say people. Um, so he sounded sincere. So I told him to come to our house a couple of days later. And he did. And Larry laid out all that he saw in Bentwaters uh, in the Rendlesham Forest, including the craft that landed, the little beings that were in it. 
Uh, the fact that the military had uh, video or movie cameras, and of course, the government denied this. As a matter of fact, I I wrote the Ministry of Defense shortly after, and they I I have those letters. I've posted them on my Facebook page. They said, "Oh no, um, it it was it was a hoax." And then I uh, I have one from the Air Force that said uh, it was a non-event. We never investigated it. Well, that's all BS. We know that now today because we know it happened. Okay, and uh, in due time, other witnesses came forward, including the the pilot that flew that film back to the U.S. So that collaborated Larry's story, and since then, Larry has had three lie detector tests by the same people that do MI five in the uk and that's their equivalent to the cia and larry passed every single one with no problem so but the thing is after larry visited us well <laughs> we noticed a bit of an increase in the government's interest on us so one night we were doing a radio show and from home and about Four or five minutes before the show started, um, I noticed this car pulled up right uh, almost across our driveway. It was a black Cadillac, and nobody got out. So I said, "Gee, that's kind of strange." And then across, the, and he was he was going the wrong way against traffic. Then across the street, a white van pulled up and parked, and nobody got out. So. We were we were doing the show. It was an hour long show, and there there was a break, an intermission, and I ran out. It was a dark, moonless night, and I ran out to see if I could see who was in that car. But it, the apparently the windows were tinted too. I couldn't see hardly anything, and I wasn't about to go up and knock on the window because it might have been the wrong kind of people in there. But the interesting thing is, they stayed right till the end of the show. Nobody ever got out. As soon as the show was over, both of them started and went down the street with their lights off. So you couldn't get a license plate or anything like that. So that's the level of surveillance uh, that we were under. From the helicopters, went every place. I don't care if we we're in Florida, if we were in um, New Hampshire, and our, some of the times it was funny because they sent this one poor guy, um, I believe it was the FBI. We were camping at this place in New Hampshire in a tent, a beautiful campground. And I put our tent up and we had a hundred, about a 110 pound German shepherd. And uh, I drove a stake in the ground and, you know, we tied him up right in front of the door of the tent. Well, about... 10 minutes after we arrived, this black SUV pulls in right across from us. And it's now, it's just, it's getting dark. You know, it's, it's uh, a little about twilight. Well, this guy gets out. First thing is weird. The guy's got a suit. Second thing is weird. He's trying to set up this tent and he can't. It's one of those ones with all the little arms you got to connect and all. And he is getting frustrated. He, this guy is cursing up a blue streak. And then finally he throws it on the ground and he goes back into the SUV. And I guess he slept in the SUV for the night. I believe that was our tail, uh, our, our FBI. I don't know what you'd call him, but uh, he, he, I don't know if he was there to observe us or protect us or <laughs> get information or what. But they were the FBI. Um, I was always sure it was them. And, and, but one thing that made it positive, one night, Betty and I, neither one of us liked cold weather. We got up at two o'clock in the morning and we went to my friend's house because he let me park my camp trailer there. He had a big yard. And we got in the camp, hooked up the camp trailer and we took off for Florida. Never told anybody. That was on the Sunday, like a two o'clock on a Sunday morning. Well, Tuesday or Wednesday, two FBI agents with photo ID show up at my job 
and they want to know where I am. Well, nobody can tell them because I never told anybody where we were going. But uh, when we got back, Betty and I went to the federal building and um, the, we told the woman at the desk we needed to speak to an agent. And they didn't keep us long, maybe about five minutes. Uh, an agent came out and I said, I, I told them, I said, you know, two of your fellows were at work looking at my job, looking for me. I said, you know, what do you all want? Well, the answer was typical. He said, well, we can neither confirm nor deny that we were there, even though I have four or five of my coworkers that saw them and my supervisor that saw the ID saying they're there. But, you know, according to them, they may have been, they may not. OK, that's how they left it. So I thought, well, here's an opportunity. I said, well, look, I said, while I'm here, let me ask you, I said, why are you guys tapping my phone? And he said, you know, he says, we always get blamed for. It. He says, but in your case, it's not us. He says, it's there for its intelligence. That's what he told me right out. <laughs> well, later on, much later on, I had to talk to some, was able to talk to someone in Air Force Intelligence. And they said, oh, no, no, that wasn't us. We, we don't, no, that was the FBI. So, you know, that's how the government runs you around in such circles. You, they, they like to confuse you. But there's another thing I'd like to bring up. If anybody else is experiencing this, so that they won't be frightened. They know where you are at all times. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, Larry Fawcett and Betty and I were scheduled to go to Chicago to do a, a television show. When we got to the airport, I got to the desk. I told him who I was. And the guy says, oh, no, he says, Mr. Luke has already boarded the plane. So I thought, well, maybe it's a relative or just somebody with the same name. And I said, no. I said, I'm Mr. Luca from such and such an address in Cheshire, Connecticut. And he says, yeah. He said, that's who boarded the plane. Well, when I did, Larry Fawcett came over to a police officer and we told the guy, no, that just can't be. And I got on a plane and nobody was in my seat. So I think they try to intimidate you. So you worry because another occasion Betty and I were going to Florida and I was kind of tired. So we stopped uh, at a KOA campground. Nobody knew we were there. Nobody. We were there for maybe 25, 30 minutes. And uh, somebody from the office came down and told Betty, uh, oh, your, your son just called. And that was impossible because nobody knew where we were but they 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 want you to think that you're well you are you're being watched all the time and i don't know what technology they have or whatever i mean i know our house was bugged and uh, well i'll get into that a little bit later um i know the house was bugged but here's another thing that is so strange and, and i i think the government has probably some pretty high-tech stuff that we're not aware of um Betty and I did some private lectures and we were lecturing for a psychologist in uh, Cromwell, Connecticut. So Betty gave her her whole speech. And then as soon as I got up, I'm going to talk about these helicopters. I no sooner than mention a word and outside the house, you can hear wop, 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 wop. Typical sound of a Huey UH-1, which that was the main hell, the, the one that we had visited, been visited by most. And the psychologist and 20 other people saw that helicopter circle the house. So, you know, what do you say? Coincidence. All right. Well, a few weeks later, uh, we were doing another private lecture for a dentist and his friends um, in uh, Meriden, Connecticut. 
Betty got done with her talk. I started talking about the helicopters and wop, 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 wop. Another, there was about 10 or 12 people there. Draw the helicopter circle the house. Okay, that's a little more than coincidence. So uh, probably three, four weeks went by. We were doing another private lecture um, for a uh, contractor in uh, uh, New Britain, Connecticut. Same exact thing. Betty got done with her talk. As soon as I started talking, whop, 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 here comes the helicopters. So, you know, you can't, you, you cannot say that as a coincidence. I'm sorry. But how did they know, not only where we were, but how did they know when I was going to start talking about the helicopters? Uh, I know there's a movie called Blue Thunder. It's it's fairly old now. But in that movie, it said all the technology that was shown in that movie was used during that time. That's about 20 years ago or more, I believe. Shotgun mics where they can be 3,000 feet up and hear you, stuff like that. Um, so it, 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 it got to be almost make you a little paranoid. Like somebody's got their eye on you, you know, all the time. But uh, another occasion, I was flying from Massachusetts back to Connecticut. And by this time, I think I was getting a little paranoid because as I was flying toward Connecticut, there were three black Hueys that were coming toward me and slightly below me. And my first thought was, oh, my God, I'm going to have a student pilot accident or something like that's going to happen. But they uh, eventually they passed by below me by about 500 feet. And I was relieved. And I thought to myself, geez, you're starting to get paranoid. And then I thought, well, there's pretty good reason to, you know, with these guys, because you never know what they're going to do. But then we decided to have a little fun with them. So I had a friend who was in the military, and he built me an exact replica of a surface-to-air missile. And I mean exact in every detail. Well, when the helicopters approached our home in Cheshire, they always came from the north. So I set that thing up on a cement pad in the back of the house. And I had flown over the house myself, so I knew what they'd see. And when they'd see it, well, one Saturday, we're sitting there and all of a sudden you can hear that typical rotor noise from the Huey UH-1. And I quick put that thing out in the back on the pad and then called Betty out. And we're standing out there watching. When that helicopter cleared the roof and he could see that thing sitting on a pad, he made such a sharp, evasive move. That helicopter went sideways. I thought he was going to pull a rotor off it. And I told Betty, I says, I'll bet you that fella's going back where he came from, get himself a shower and change his clothes. Because that, it was obvious that they were watching us. I mean, that was just obvious. <laughs> There's no way, it, you know, that it couldn't be. But, uh, it, you know, we decided to, to have a little fun with them. And uh, in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, we were doing a lecture, and um, during an intermission, this fella come rushing over to me, and I got the distinct impression that he was uh, in some way related to the military. He was he's probably mid thirties. He had a buzz cut haircut. The buttons on his shirt were straight down and lined up exactly with his belt buckle. He had sharply creased pants and shiny black shoes. And, you know, that was my thought. As soon as the guy approached me, I said, oh, man, this guy's military or something. And this is what he said. He says, you know, we're just sending the helicopters so we don't have to hurt you. And so I thanked him, you know, and walked away. That was it. Uh, we never stopped. We never let up. But also when we were doing a uh, lecture at MIT in Massachusetts, during a break, Dr. Hynek 
walked up to Betty and uh, cause I was, I was d- uh, down talking to someone else. He walked up to Betty, didn't say hello or anything. He said, stick to philosophy and leave the military out of this. But she got blamed, but I was the one that was harassing the military with freedom of information and all kinds of stuff, because I, I, I didn't like the fact that what they were saying made us look like liars. Okay. We did, uh, I'll give you, for instance, we did a, a three-part news series on uh, Channel 8 News in Connecticut. And I accused, I didn't accuse, I just said that there's documents that show the FBI's involvement in the UFO phenomena. And I had the documents through Freedom of Information. Well, the FBI made a statement and said, we are uh, we have enough or we're busy enough with crime here. We don't deal with that at all. So I challenged the FBI to do a show with me, not on what happened to Betty and me, but on the documents I had on them. And for some reason, they weren't interested. <laughs> they didn't want to get involved. Well, as the things got more intense, let's say, um, I had a friend that was a, uh, I don't want to, I can't give his name away. He, he was an advisor to the White House and he came up one day and he came to the door and he asked me to come outside. Because obviously he knew our house was bugged. Well, he said, Bob, he said, uh, last week, he says, I was at a CIA meeting. And he says, I have to tell you, he said, they're talking about you guys. He says, you want to be careful. And I thanked him. I think that was nice of him because he put himself and his job at risk if anybody had found out. Well, I, I didn't know exactly what to expect. And then uh was only a couple weeks later. Betty and I are both bedded down for the night. And it's probably after midnight. I don't remember exactly what time it was anymore, but I could have sworn I heard a male voice talking to someone in our kitchen. And the bedroom, there was just a hallway between the kitchen and the bedroom. And then you had to make, when you left the bedroom, you had to make a right turn to get into the kitchen. Well, um, I got up a little bit propped up on one elbow and I'm trying to listen. And I look, we had a big, uh, about 110 pound German shepherd. And he slept on the floor at the foot of the bed. Well, I see the poor dog get up and all of a sudden his front legs just went right out from under him and he flopped flat on his face. And I'm thinking, Oh, something's, you know, I'm half asleep, but I know something is not right. So I reach in my uh, my night table where I had a 38 and I'm going to go confront whoever's in the house because they don't belong there. Well, that was the last thing I remember. I woke up in the morning with a, oh my, a miserable headache, pounding headache. Betty got up. She said, oh my gosh. She said, my head is hurting. So we both had jobs at the time. So we both got up, went off to work. She came home at night. She says, I don't know what's wrong. She says, my left arm has hurt me all day. And I said, that's kind of funny. I says, my right arm is, has really been hurting me all day. Well, she's right-handed. I'm left-handed. So we stripped off our shirts and whatnot. And each of us had um, like a, a circular black and well not black and black and tannish light tan colored circle about an inch and a quarter on each arm and with a puncture mark in the middle so somebody stuck us i called the doctor my their family doctor and i said if we go to the hospital i said will it show up in the blood he said no it's too late he said that would have dissipated already so i couldn't call the police because what am i going to tell them Oh, we're involved in the UFO phenomenon. And somebody came in the house and drugged us. And there's only two reasons I can think of. One, maybe they wanted to question us under some kind of truth serum or something. 
or two, they might have been looking for something that we had. Um, one of the sessions that they did, the investigators did, they gave us a wrong tape by mistake. And I got home and uh, I played it. I didn't have much time because I had to go to work, but I just plugged it in and see what it said. It, it was a meeting of scientists from all around the world. So I said, oh, whoa, this is something. So I shut it off. And that day I get a call and they said, uh, we need that tape back. So being a good guy, you know, I wrap it up and I sent it back. But being not that good a guy, I copied it first. And I may still have it today. I don't really know because we've got hundreds and hundreds of tapes and stuff. And we've moved four or five times. So I don't know if I ever come across it, whatever it is, it may, it'll, will be made public. But um, I don't know if they were after that or if they just wanted to uh, question us or things like that. Well, one of the pictures I sent you is a black helicopter uh, sitting behind a fence. And I had been trying to find out whose helicopters these were for ages. So I had gone to a Bradley International Airport because at the uh, north end of the airport is the Army National Guard. So I drove right up there and I'm taking pictures of their helicopters, but the ones they had that were black all had a white, uh, big white patch on the front, you know, so it signify it's an Army National Guard. Well, somebody came rushing out and said, hey, you, you can't be here. You know, what are you doing? So I gave him a picture of one of the helicopters I took over the house. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, I'm just looking for, I, I have a complaint to make about low-flying helicopters. And I showed him the picture. He, he looked, he says, those don't come from here. And he told me where they came from. It was another state. It wasn't Connecticut. So over the weekend, Betty and I, off we go. And I find the place. And that's where I took the picture, that one uh, that's on the ground there, to verify, number one, they are black. They are not olive drab. They are black. And there's no markings on them. But this area was so sensitive. They had signs up all over. No two-way radios, no cameras, no firearms, all of which I had in my car. So I ran out. I snapped that picture. I got in the car and got the heck out of there. You know, as soon as I could. Uh, I guess that could have involved jail time from, from what I gather. Uh, and another interesting thing, I took a photo of a helicopter that was actually circling us. Okay. So I said, damn, it's a, it's a Huey UH-1. So I, I wrote to Bell Helicopter in Texas. They're the ones that make that helicopter. And uh, I forget the man's name right now, the public relations person. But he was very nice. He wrote me back a letter and he said, well, he said, we built that helicopter. He said, but it never left here like that. He said, that's been modified by the military for psychological warfare. And I was a little surprised, but, you know, people will question things like that. But I still have the letter from him saying that that was built for psychological warfare. Now, why it was circling us, and it, you know, who knows? Uh, I don't know. Then there's another case. I was up on the roof of the house. Um, <laughs> not for very care. I was just putting shingles on the roof. And this black uh, Sikorsky Blackhawk, there weren't too many then because this is back in the 80s. They were kind of new. Comes over real low. I, I sent you that picture too. And I got a compass heading and I said, son of a gun. I said, he's, he's looked like he was headed back to Sikorsky. So I went down, got off the roof, went down, picked up the phone. I called Sikorsky, asked to talk to the tower. 
And I asked the tower, I said, do you have a large black helicopter in this area? And he said, yes, we do. I said, well, I want to file a complaint. He said, why? I says, because it was excessively low over my home. So he said, okay, we'll take care of it. So a couple of days later, I got a, a letter from Sikorsky, a letter of apology. But here's the thing. The guy in the tower said that uh, that is an uh, army uh, Blackhawk, is what he said. Okay, so I got a letter of apology stating that it was a Navy aircraft. So I wrote him back. I said, well, you know, th this doesn't make sense. I said, the tower told me that it was an army aircraft. And this is a God's honest truth. They wrote me back. They said, well, it's an army aircraft being flown by a Navy acceptance crew. For a while there, they were taking a lot of pictures of us, too, uh, from uh, a Huey UH-1 came over this place where my wife was shopping, and the guy is literally sitting in it with his feet on the landing rail with a camera taking pictures of Betty. We had we were in Florida, and uh, we're in a laundromat, and this guy pulls into the yard, jumps out of the car, takes three or four pictures of us. And Betty said to the uh, the operator, she said, is this place for sale or something? Is that why they're taking pictures? And the lady said, no. So I ran out quick. And before the guy got out into the street, I got the license plate. I gave the license plate to Larry Fawcett. And again, it comes back unissued. So, we had our pictures taken when we we're at the outdoor movies, uh, out shopping. Uh, I don't know what the what the purpose is of that. I mean, what good are pictures going to do them? You know, they know what we, what we look like. Now, Betty and I did not get intimidated by these people, so we turned it around a bit. I called the CIA, told them who I was told them I'm doing a book on the phenomena and told them I want to interview them. And they turned me down so fast it would make your head spin. So then Betty and I went to um, Cape Canaveral was then. And we talked to the guard at the, one of the desks, told him we're doing a book and we'd like to interview the administrator and uh, could derange that. Well, he called down the to the office, and I was amazed. They said, uh, "Yes, he'll talk to you." I said, "This is great," but I didn't. They didn't know who we were, so it it was a long walk to the uh, administrator's office. That's a big. It's a huge place. We finally got down there, and we were met at the door by a secretary, who told us he wasn't there. I just, he was there five minutes ago when we called. But see, they don't like it when you go after them. As long as they're going to try to intimidate you, it's okay. But they don't want to talk to you whatsoever. Uh, I We were doing a TV show in West Lake. I think it was Lake Worth. And I brought up some of the things that the government was doing. And... Uh, there was a gentleman in the back with a fairly well-dressed guy with a suit on. He, and he said, who do you think you are to accuse the government of doing these things? And I said, I don't accuse anybody of doing anything without proof. I said, if you would like to see the documents, you come see me after the show. Well, he never showed up after the show. So I don't know what the point was. They have tried uh, a number of times to discredit us when we lived in um, Middletown, Connecticut, or Cromwell, which is near Middletown. I found out, I was told by people that there were two people downtown Middletown that looked similar to Betty and I, and they were trying to hawk or trying to sell the, uh, our books on the street. Now, that would have made us look a little foolish. But it, was, it wasn't us. Um, 
and I'll, I'll tell you how far they went. This is amazing. Outside of our house, I had a pretty good driveway, probably about 150 foot. And about halfway down, there was a big uh, maple tree. In that maple tree, they put a platform and they actually had a guy on that platform monitoring our house. I mean, what a total waste of taxpayer money. And the, back then in the, in the 80s, I did I checked and I found out to fly those Hueys cost about $500 an hour back then. Oh, my God. I wish I had the money they spent keeping an eye on us. I'd be living a lot better today, I'll tell you. But uh, I don't know. Government just, I don't know how they do things, why they do what they do. Now, I'll tell you this about, and this is my opinion, um, and I'll tell you why. Government and corporations are suppressing advanced technology from the public. Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail on that in a minute. And how I know... I worked in Florida at a place called Energy Partners. I was a hydrogen fuel cell research technician. This company, they had some bright, bright engineers. They built a unit for your home that would supply heat, hot water, and electricity, and it made no pollution. There were no moving parts. It was one filter that had to be changed once a year, and that was it. So, in other words, you wouldn't need to be hooked up to the grid. You'd never have a power failure. You didn't have to buy oil for your furnace. And we were we were just ecstatic because the prototypes had been built. They'd been tested, retested, tested again, and we're ready to go into production. Well... One day we had some visitors. It was from ExxonMobil. And uh, they nosed around the place. Uh, you know, I didn't have access to what they what happened up front or anything. But a few weeks later, we all came into work and it was a big sign on the on the door. Go to the Ramada Inn, a certain conference room. So most of us are thinking, oh wow, you know, we're we're going to start producing these things, mass producing them and selling them and whatnot. And it'll be great. Yeah, we got there. We were met by the attorneys from uh, Exxon Mobil, and we all got fired. And uh, we had to sign non-disclosure agreements and whatnot. They've, what they've done, they buy the technology and they shelve it so that people, the public, can't have access to it. And in addition to that, if you want to look it up, there are over 5,000 different energy efficient devices that have been classified so that the public cannot have access. And I just don't think that's right. I also think that is the real reason that full disclosure will never happen because I, I even put on my Facebook page, Let's say, just say for the fun of it, that a group of friendly aliens happen to come by overtly and maybe give us a little technology, uh, maybe like their energy source. Maybe we could each have one in our home and it might give us power indefinitely without being hooked up to the grid. And it might be able to drive our vehicles without gasoline or batteries. And they may have some pretty advanced, I know they've got advanced healing methods because I know people that have been healed of very serious diseases after UFO uh, exposure. Well, that means we wouldn't need the grid. There goes the electric companies. We wouldn't need the oil companies because we just wouldn't need them anymore. We wouldn't need gasoline anymore. Uh, and then there wouldn't be any wars over oil because there would be no use for it anymore. And big pharma would probably go down the tubes, too. So and those are the people that make the massive amounts of money in the trillions 
And those are the people that control pretty much what we do. And they control, I don't care what anybody said, they control the governments, they buy the politicians. Uh, and and they, they just, I think it was Howard Hughes years ago, said, let me control uh, the country's money and I'll control the country. And I believe that's how it is today. Um, I believe that's why there's such a, uh, so much resistance against real disclosure. And furthermore, if you look back a bit, it was a fellow named Ben Rich. He was the CEO of Lockheed Skunk Works. Now, this is a man that was in a position to know, okay? He said before he died, he said that there are two types of UFOs, the ones they build and the ones we build. He also went on to say that we have the technology to take ET home. He said, we can do almost anything you can imagine, but this technology is so tied up in black projects that it would take an act of God to ever get it to the public. So uh, this goes right along with what I've said and thought for a long time, that it's all about the money. It's all about the corporations and the government, of course, plays right along with it because it's beneficial to them or they've been bought and paid for. Simple as that. And so, are there are there any any uh, uh, parts of the experiences we've had that you do you have any questions on anything? Well, I'd like to get into some of the other drawings that you sent to me. Um, you sent me a, a yeah. drawing of a, a of a lady with long hair. Right. Okay. I've been looking for her for a long time. She was on a UFO craft, and they were removing fetuses from her. But for some reason, the beings couldn't control her. They couldn't, like most people, they'll, they'll put you in a state where you just, oh, okay, you know. Uh, they couldn't control her. So what they did, they, they uh, brought Betty aboard that craft, being another human, being a woman, to try to talk to her and calm her. And Betty did spend the time with her, and she did calm her down a bit. They took two fetuses from this woman. And what they did, they don't let them breathe. They put them right into a, I don't know if it's water, but it's a, a clear-looking liquid. And they said they do not want them to breathe. And they, they put them in this water tank they hook up to them and i, I don't pursue that i don't think anybody does um but they said that they will them eyelids and they will become like the gray beings in time so that's that's where that woman came from and i know some i know somebody i swear i think she's the woman but uh, if she is she's not admitting it to me the the key word the picture um, it doesn't show in a picture, but Betty said you can tell because she's got a good space be between her two front. She looks exactly like that. And when I saw her smile, I said, oh, my God, that's got to be her. But according to her, it isn't. So, you know, not much I can do about it one way or another. Let's get into when you um, you got your computer hacked by the Department of Defense. I don't know why they were so interested, but uh, my computer was hacked by the Navy Space Weapons Division. And then 48 hours later, it was hacked by the Army. Now, I don't know. They should have known that I was a computer technician and I had some good, really good software because I got everything. I got the physical tree address of those computers. I got their the network numbers. I got the name of the uh, operators of the computer. Um, every bit of information on them. So I wrote to the inspector general and I basically, I said, why are you all hacking my computer? And 
I have it in writing. They admitted, yes, he said, that was our computer, one Navy, one Army. And they said, we will do an investigation. Well, I'm glad I didn't hold my breath waiting for that investigation because it never happened. So I tried to push things along. I wrote the United States Attorney General, and they said, well, if it's a computer hacking, that comes under the jurisdiction of the FBI. So I wrote the FBI and asked them to investigate. <laughs> uh, they didn't seem too enthused about it. Let's put it that way. So I wrote them and wrote them and wrote them. And pretty soon they would return my certified mail with a return receipt unopened. Is that I just bugged the living daylights out of them. They did not want to do it and they wouldn't do it. So there was never an investigation done. Uh, I tried our state senator for help. They snowballed him just the same way. So, you know, I, I don't know what they expected might have been on a computer, but I assure you, if it was anything that sensitive, it's on another computer that is not on the Internet. You know, I have two computers here that are one is on uh, online. The other one is not. But I don't know what they expected to find, but it must have been pretty good, whatever they thought. Now, getting related to that, uh, three of our residences were broken into um, at different times. And when we were in uh, Higginham, Connecticut, we were going to California to do a lecture. We got back and my uh, the RV was all had rope tied all around it. One of the neighbors said he came home from work one day and found the door open. And they somebody smashed the door and pretty good. So I said, oh boy, I wonder what's missing. So we went back in there and, excuse me, um, they're in the in there. I was repairing computers at the time, so there were computers, there were jewelry, there was firearms, there was some money, not much. Um, but all that was taken was two of the drawings that Betty did of the bottom section, or what would have been the propulsion system of the UFO craft. So uh, we were in a rural area, so I had to call the state police. And a young fellow come up and I, I, did, I told him, look, I said, we're heavily involved in the UFO phenomena. I think I, I said, I think this was probably some government organization. I said, I don't think somebody would just break in to steal these two things. And he was a really nice guy. He said, well, look, he says, I'll investigate. He says, if I find anything, he says, I will tell you. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, great. Finally, somebody that's going to be honest, you know. Well. About a week went by, and I said, I stopped by his office. And I go in, and there's a trooper there. And I said, Is Trooper so and so here? Uh, no, he's been transferred. I said, Where's he been transferred to? Oh, we don't know. They don't tell us. I said, So there's no way I can get a hold of him? He's no, afraid not. I said, Gee whiz. Okay. That. Uh, like I say, the government had long arms. They get, they can get everybody and anybody, even the IRS. When 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 uh, one of the audits, one of the latter audits, um, we got into literally got into shouting matches, and they told uh, the guy. Oh, he asked me for documents that were twelve years old, and I said. Uh, uh I said, you can't ask me for anything more than seven years old. I said, I'm not that dumb. Well, he said, all right. He said, uh, you know, he says, we'll just audit your ex-wife to get that information because he wanted, they want to know about child support and stuff. And uh, my ex-wife and I did not get along at all at that time. So when he said that, I told him, I said, well, you want to get busy then, don't you? But it was so bad, they wouldn't take my canceled checks as proof of payment for taxes, sewer water taxes, mortgage. So I had to go to the bank and get signed statements, and then I had to go to the town and get signed statements to give to the IRS, which is 
plain and simple harassment. And later on, um, Connecticut Magazine did an article on a lot of these problems we had, and they contacted uh, Burnley, which was the, I gave her name and everything, uh, the IRS agent. And uh, she's, oh, no, no, that was not harassment. And I get yeah, right. But I think people could see for themselves, you know, what that, it was pure and simple harassment. They didn't like that we were talking at the time. And uh, they were going to make us as miserable as, as they possibly could uh, for, for speaking out. It's that simple. Um, any, other, any of the other pictures? There's one with, uh, there's a triangle with a head on it. Uh, like a pyramid? Pyramid, yes. Okay, that is super interesting. Because Betty saw that in 1967. Okay, and she drew it then, and it's dated. And that face is exactly like the face on Mars that Vikings saw 10 years later. So uh, I'm not saying that pyramid was on mars but i'm saying that some civilization apparently has put up some kind of monuments like that somewhere uh not not on this earth uh it, it, there's just so much that is kept from us like of today i would i would give my right arm to know what's really happening in antarctica for instance but you you not you can't get the truth out of anybody. Well, you can't blame them because they're probably told they'll be shot or their family will be killed or something if they talk. Like, um, I think it was uh, um, Armstrong was told that if he talked about what he saw on the moon, that he, his wife, and his kids would be killed. So then you can't blame them for not talking, you know. But if if I saw something myself, yeah. I would make many, many copies of DVDs or whatnot and pass them all over the place free before anything happened. But uh, too, too many, too many people have been silenced in the past. I don't think they're not. I don't believe they're killing people anymore. I after Phil Schneider, I think he was probably the last one that they they kicked. Because I doubt, I seriously doubt that man committed suicide in that manner. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of hard to believe, but I I don't think today they're that bad because they can no longer deny it. Everybody's got cameras, everybody's got cell phones, uh, witnesses. A lot of very credible witnesses have come forward. Um, I've interviewed people from every branch of the military. I was told by Marines that they saw UFOs rising out of the jungles in Vietnam. I was told uh, people on, the, I think it was the, U, uh, the USS Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier, that they had, uh, they were paced by a UFO that wasn't that uh, high up or that far away. And apparently the people that did see it were all sent off in different directions. So, you know, they don't, if you're in the military, that's the last thing they want you to do is be talking about it. But I think that Louis uh, Alonzo, I think he's trying to get help so the military can speak out a little freer about it and, and uh, you know, not be not lose their pensions or whatever just because they, they tell the truth. And that's the biggest thing today. If you too many times, if you tell the truth. You're going to get persecuted for it. And it's just not right. Uh, so I don't know anything I see or whatnot, I'm going to tell whatever happens after that. I really don't care. You know, I mean, it, it's a beautiful thing when you get older, because once you get old, I figure, hey, I've been on this earth that many years now. If I see anything that should be told by God, I'm going to say it. And what they want to do, go ahead. What, they can't threaten you anymore. Once you get as old as me, uh, what are they going to do? Say, oh, we'll kill you? Well, yeah. I don't know how many more years I'm going to be here anyway. I'm, I'm not going to worry about it, that's for sure. You sent me a picture of a, a cigar UFO. Yes. Um, that was taken 
over our home in Hayes, Virginia. And here's why it's very interesting. A couple days later, uh, where we lived in Hayes, you, you uh, about a mile and a half down the road, you had to go over this pretty long bridge to cross the, the, cross the James River. Well, somebody put a big sign on that bridge that says UFO sighted here. So when I took that picture, I did not see that. I, there was, uh, I blew it up, so there was a helicopter also in that picture. But when I blew it up, I lost the helicopter. So we're not that far from Langley, so I called Langley, and I said, you know, I, said, I, I know you guys have some fantastic photo interpretation um, uh, equipment, and I asked them if they would like to examine the photo. And, you know, they had no interest at all. Isn't that kind of strange? That's what they said. No, no, we don't want to see it. And I wish I had the equipment that they had because you could you could pick up so much more detail and stuff. But why would they say they're not interested when it's flying in our airspace and it's obviously not ours? I, I would think that any military would be interested. But that's just not the case. That's again, government does things the way government does things. And we're the ones that are stuck with it and we're the ones that pay for it. So okay, I don't know. You sent me a, a patent of what looks like a TR3B, but not really, like a triangle UFO. Oh yeah. That was um 1978. Betty and I had gone to Massachusetts from Connecticut. And we we're on our way back. And I'll never forget this because it was a there was a red arts garage was the last thing we passed. And all of a sudden there was actually three triangular shaped craft. And way above them was a a ball. I don't know, it looked like a, almost like a disco ball way above them. And I said, oh, my God, those, I knew that was, that's a UFO. So I had in my car, I had a, a, a spotlight, a handheld spotlight. So I shined it up on the first one. I blinked it two or three times. <laughs> Excuse me. And over our radio came a bunch of tones. And the radio was shut off. And yet you heard like, do, 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 do. and I'm saying, oh, my God. You know, this is interesting. So I want to follow him. Well, our daughter, Cindy, was in the back seat and she got so scared. She got on the floor and she don't follow him. Don't follow him. But it was country roads. And once they made their way out, I couldn't keep up with them anyway. But I, I don't know where where they were going. I, I doubt at that time in the seven. I doubt that was ours. I know we do have a UFO today. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. Uh, how I know is I got a copy of the patent, and it was made by a fellow named Caesar. No, I can't remember his last name. But anyways, this craft um, was patented in 2018, I believe. And the interesting thing is, it says on the patent, operational. Usually it doesn't say that. So it's been this thing has been in the air at least since 2018. And it says the performance is this is um, the same in the air, in the water or in space. And it is an anti-gravity craft. And anybody that doesn't believe me can look it up for themselves in the U.S. Patent Office. Um, so God only knows the TR-3B came before this. This one is much more advanced. Uh, of course, they don't tell you everything about how it works or anything. because, And I understand the reason they patented it, because the Chinese were working on something similar, and they wanted to make sure we had the patent on it first. So um, thank God we do and they don't. You know, that's a good thing. But... Uh, I'm just trying to think of it, other other things that uh, 
incidences that you might be interested in, but I'm starting to draw a blank here. Uh, what happened with the, uh, well, he sent me a nice photo of Betty in front of uh, Poppy Boyington, the, uh, the plane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, we had gone to the Air Museum, and the the ironic thing about that is his, he was the pilot, allegedly, that flew the debris from the Roswell crash out of Roswell. And how we know that, his wife said he told her that when he was dying. He was the one that actually flew the UFO materials uh, out of uh, Roswell. So and when we saw that, I thought, oh, boy, I got to take a picture of you with this airplane. Um, on a side note, um... A fan of mine wanted to wanted me to ask a question. Now, Whitley Strieber lost sure. also his wife um, a few years back, but she's been communicating with him after that uh, in some form or of another. Oh, yeah. Has uh, Betty done the same to you in dreams, perhaps? Oh, no, much more than in dreams. Um, she physically... Uh, let me know when when she was going. Um, all right, I'm going to tell you this. People, <laughs> they're going to look at me as nuts, but I don't care. It's the truth. I have on my desk a touch lamp, okay? You touch it once, it lights up red. Touch it again, lights up green, and so on. It's just the very lightest touch of the finger will set it off. Well, several years ago, a good friend, a uh, friend since grade school, passed away. And I was sitting here in the office, and I was I was looking at his picture, remembering some of the stupid stuff we did and everything. And all of a sudden, this light starts going off on, off on, off, faster than a person can do it. And I said, Art, right, if that's you, turn it off. And it went off. And I said, oh, my God, they, his spirit must have been here. Well, a couple of years later, that happened again, and only the man's name was Eddie. Same exact thing. And that light never has gone on or off any other time. And then when Betty was in the hospital, she, was, um, I, she wasn't in a coma, but, I mean, she was very heavily sedated. And I was sitting in the kitchen because uh, the hospital would only allow one person at a time then because of COVID. So our daughter, Bonnie, was there with her. I was sitting in the kitchen. I heard, a, I mean, in the living room, and I heard a big crash in the kitchen, like, like a pan dropped or something. So I went out. Nothing was disturbed at all. I said, oh. but as I walked by, I could see down the hallway. It's about 30 feet down to the office, and I could see that light was blinking off and on. So I quickly grabbed my video camera to show that nobody is near it. Nobody's touching it. And that was Betty saying goodbye. But she didn't pass then. But she never was able to speak or anything, you know, after that time. Well, not too long ago, um, I had a session with Patricia Baker and two other psychics. And... I was able to communicate directly with Betty and it was so amazing. I know a lot of people may not believe in this, but Betty told me things that there's no way in a world anybody else could know. And her daughter, Becky, Becky passed before her. One time Becky and I had a bit of an argument, not an argument, a disagreement um, over something and I never told Betty because I didn't want to upset her, you know. And Becky, when she was contacted, she was with Betty at, the, at, at this, I don't know, setting, whatever you want to call it. And she mentioned it to me and actually said she knew she was wrong. Now, nobody in this world knew about that, not even my wife. So I intend to go back um, and have another 
obsession and get more and and she advised me on my health too and it's like she said uh she told me about my diet and what i'm doing wrong and i mean how do you explain that but you know it's it's just it's what it is um i think over the years the veil between our dimension and those that are deceased i think that veil is either thinning or lifting that's why we we titled that book a lifting of the veil because Betty was told by the beings that more and more would be exposed as time went by. And it sure looks like that's happening. She was also told that um, one of the reasons they were taking so much seed uh, from women and, and sperm from men was because eventually, because of all the pollution, everything that mankind was going to go sterile. And surprisingly enough, there's been a number of studies on uh, done and they're they're showing that um, the sperm count has dropped by more than half already in in most men, all around the world. So, you know, they obviously they know what they're doing. Uh, people uh, people say, oh, they have no right to abduct us and all that. But in the first place, if they really seeded us here, well, then I guess they do have a right. And the thing that I get a little irritated with some people that say, oh, the abduction thing, it's terrifying, it's horrible. It's... Well, I don't know of anybody that's been hurt, and I know some people find going to the dentist terrifying. Um, I found, I was I was frightened first time. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. But when they put me on that table and all, they gave off, they said, don't worry, you won't be harmed and all. And they gave off this feeling of, uh, I don't know, it just made me relax. And I never, any of the time we've been up, um, I've never been hurt or harmed in any way. As a matter of fact, one time when we were in Meriden, Connecticut, uh, we were both taken together out of the house. And we we're taken into a craft. Betty was uh we were taken by in the spirit, by the way, not physically. Our bodies were still in the house. Okay, that sounds weird, but that's true. So, um, and Betty, I saw her once we got up there. They took her to another area. And she was a light person, a light being. In other words, no, you couldn't make out her face or features or anything. She was like a a light person, and two of the very tall elders um they have white robes and they have very pale skin and uh kind of blue light blue almost purplish eyes white hair um they got one on each side of me and i'm looking i'm going, uh oh what do i do now uh and they were they're very tall my i'm six foot and i my head top of my head came about up to their shoulders very tall and they took me aside and they told me some things which was extremely interesting for one thing they impressed upon me look they said you do not die only the physical body dies they said the light being does not die it continues on and I assume when they say the light being, they're talking about your consciousness um, or your spirit or whatever. Um, and then they told me about uh, evil on the earth. And they said the reason the evil exists in this dimension is because we are put here as like a school. And we all have the ability to do evil. We all have the ability to do good. And the choices we make here and now are going to determine where we're going later and what's going to happen to us. And they also said that since the creator gave us free will, there had to be more than one choice and that you know that's so simple it, it's obvious so yeah you can do all kinds of crap while you're here but you are going to pay for it later 
they also mentioned that people that are um, abusive to animals, they said that we don't realize the importance of animals and that people that are abusive to them in any way, um, I, I will pay a pretty good price when they get on the other side. So I don't know. I love my animals and uh, <laughs> I would never harm them, but uh, it, it sounds like, I don't know, almost like that's a test or something because, you know, any, usually anybody that would hurt animals intentionally, I wouldn't say was a good person to start with, but, uh, just my opinion, but, the, uh, there was much more. It's, it's in the, um, it's in one of the books, I think the watchers too. And when this was, oh, and then they asked me to explain, um, or, this was when I was under hypnosis. I was coming out with these things and the investigators were kind of surprised because I was just like, you know, a nuts and bolts kind of guy. And they didn't know where I was coming up with all these answers to these things. And one of the, one of the, uh, hip, the hypnotist said, well, tell me what, uh, uh, God is. And, under this is under hypnosis. I didn't remember t any of this until I heard the tape later. But um, I said that something to the effect that that is like wanting to know the length, width, and breadth of the entire universe. It's beyond beyond the comprehension of the human mind. And they were just they were shocked about this stuff. But, uh, you know, hey, I was just at that time, I was just uh, basically a mechanic and I didn't have a lot of knowledge about the spiritual. But that I learned uh, quickly that there is much more, well, especially once the, once you're pulled out of your body to be taken somewhere, you learn that there's a lot more than what you see in this physical in this physical realm. You know, and I'm I'm a true believer today, I'll tell you. Was there a story that when you were on, on board a craft that one of the ETs said to you that you should consider yourself lucky for being there? Oh, yeah, that was the, the, those two big white guys. He said, um, he said, you know, it's a privilege for you to be here. And I said, why? And he said, because you are not as spiritually advanced as Betty. And at that time, believe me, I wasn't. You know, uh, I wasn't at all, but they did impart that information to me. And, uh, you know, I, I've been trying to get truth out to people ever since. And there's, there's so much baloney that goes on with the UFO phenomena. It's hard to fathom because you get the government is is paying or has people on a payroll just to do disinformation. Um, there's a guy named Rick Doty. He used to be with Air Force Office of Special Investigation. And I filed Freedom of Information, and man, he sent me some bogus documents. Okay? And now that he's out of the military, he has come clean. He admitted his job was disinformation. And not only that, he admitted that there are uh, government people in almost every media outlet that determines what's going to get out and what isn't. And he said many times he was handed uh, uh, bags of money to bring to these places to keep to quash various stories. So I am so glad that he came clean uh, because it's it, Telling people, you know, we can't believe the media today. You know, it, you just can't. I don't believe anything I see on the news today. Uh, I know in the past, when Betty and I have done art newspaper articles and stuff like that, quite often they didn't come out quite the way we said it. You know, they were twisted. Um, and, and that was... Uh, Probably to uh, make us look foolish or something like that, you know. But I don't care. We Betty and I were always 
Uh, credibility was our number one concern. I don't talk about other people's cases because I wasn't there. Uh, and, and I don't like to see people come on and say, well, I know the agenda of the UFOs. Well, no, you don't, because there's groups of them and they have different agendas. You know, so I I, I, I hate to see that stuff. I, I think I told you there was a guy named Trevor Constable. I couldn't remember his name. Years ago, he said, there are no experts in the UFO field, only people with varying degrees of ignorance. And I think that still stands true today. I think he was right on the money. <laughs> and I, I just feel bad when I see some of the stuff that people are pushing out there. That, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are are making money off of stuff that didn't happen to them uh and they're kind of embellishing this stuff to make it i don't know more like like how like you know, travis walton's case he came out and said look what was in the movie didn't really happen to me you know they take they take license to do stuff like that and it's just uh it's not right and people deserve the truth and the, the other thing about the coming UFO invasion, Warner and Brown mentioned that, what, back in the 70s, before when he was dying. Yeah, there'll be, an, a, there'll be an invasion, all right, but it'll be by the government and it'll be fake because the actual beings are not going to invade us or this world. They told us that they love mankind and they want to help. They're limited in what they can do because there are rules and regulations like with anything else. But we probably will see an alien invasion and it more than likely will be from our government, you know, compliments of our tax dollars again. And that's another thing that really a couple of things really tick me off. One, Betty and I were treated worse than the mafia. I mean, they tapped the phone. They followed us. They had the helicopters. They had the IRS. Uh, they didn't do anything worse to the, the mafia when they were tracking them down. And yet neither of us have any any kind of re criminal record at all. The worst thing I had on my record was I used to race a lot and I used to get tickets, you know, for speeding and stuff like that. But I mean, that's no big deal. But uh yeah, it, it's just it, it's disgusting in so many ways. I hope Louis Alonzo, I think he's doing a good job, but I also think he has been not been given all the information. Because, like I say, going back to uh, people like Ben Rich, they knew they knew what those things were years ago. And here they're saying, oh, they don't know. They have to investigate. Oh, that's BS. They know darn well what they are. Um, they're not UFOs, they're IFOs or identified flying objects. Uh, but to get people in government or in the military, especially to talk, I guess mostly they can't for fear of their jobs or their pensions or whatever. But I'll tell you what, I would love to have one. I would love to get abducted again and have an opportunity to talk. These people are so far advanced. Yeah, I call them people. They're so far advanced, and there's so much that they could help us with, probably even cleaning up our atmosphere and our and our uh, ground and our water. Man, we we people, we're stupid. We're messing up our only home. Yeah. And uh, it, it can't go on forever because eventually we're not going to be able to live on this planet. And then uh, we're going to need help from somewhere and i i don't look to the government for that help i'll tell you that right now and by the way i saw in 1997 i saw a triangle shaped craft reasonably low i'd say probably no more than 500 to a thousand feet right over to washington dc area because we were we were house sitting up there and I shined my, uh, I had a, a, a flat, 
good size flashlight. I figure it was a four cell flat, a big flashlight. And I shined it on that when it went over and it was just flat black. It just, the light didn't show up at all on it. And it had two rows of very dull lights that went down the center. Uh, like if you have a rheostat and you turn the lights down, it's just like, just the filament turns just like orange. And then there, there was, uh, another row of lights went down each side of the V. And I saw that just as clear as day. And uh, I, it just freaked me out because it, it, it thing was huge, number one. It's bigger than an airliner. And yet there was absolutely no sound, not even wind rushing by it. You know, I didn't expect the, the propulsion system to make noise, but you would think it, at that size and that speed, you would hear wind noise, and I heard absolutely nothing, nothing at all. Um, you sent me a photo of the UFO museum at Roswell. Is there a story with that? Yeah, uh, Betty and I went there uh, in the 90s, and we were fortunate enough. Uh, Clifford Stone was there, and... Um, Walter Hutt, the guy that released uh, the information to the newspapers that the Army had the UFO craft. And uh, uh, one of the neighbors, Mrs. Proctor, I believe her name was. So we got to talk to all those people firsthand. And uh, Clifford Stone was part of the program for crash retrieval. And uh, he such a nice guy i mean i was just totally impressed with these people there was no no bs no building up anything to make it look more than it was uh and just honest people and mrs proctor told me she said they did when they had that stuff she said they did beat it with a hammer and they did try to burn it and whatnot and she said they couldn't make a mark in it now if that was tinfoil, like the military would have us believe, if you can't, if you can't mark tinfoil with a sledgehammer, you got a bit of a problem. Um, but anyway, very pleasant, very enjoyable visit there. Nice people. Anybody you know that's in the area or goes to Roswell, uh, I would advise them to stop in. Yeah, I, I think they'd enjoy it. Great displays, a lot of books from various people in there and whatnot. Um, and you get to talk to some interesting people. Hmm. I, ne I, never, I never joined MUFON or anything else because what I do, I like being independent. I don't want anybody to tell me how to do anything or what to do because the only thing I'm interested in getting out is the truth. And if I can, whatever I find and can verify i will talk about if I, I i won't talk about other people's cases um you know i i won't put myself in, in that position because the only one that really knows what happened to people like travis walton or betty and barney or whatnot are them and i don't like these uh what we call armchair uh ufologists uh, they come up and tell you, well, that couldn't have happened to them or this couldn't have happened. To them. Well, no, you weren't there. You don't know what. So my whole thing, the only thing I am after is the very truth. And anything I find out now, you know, I'm alone now. Betty is gone. Now I have a lot of time and I am going to get into things a lot deeper. And anything I do find out, yeah, I will make public. Uh, that's for sure. But it will be only the actual truth that I can verify. Um, I think people deserve better. I think we we have paid for God knows how much money we've laid out for this government's cover up. And we, the, the people, the taxpayers deserve answers. And we're not getting them, not from the government anyway. I don't believe full disclosure will ever come from the government. And I know this for a fact. They will not ever talk about the abduction problem because the military has been emasculated because they can't do a darn thing to stop it and they know it they nothing at all they can do to stop it it's going to continue 
And I just hope people realize that instead of being terrified, they ought to realize that it's an opportunity to gain information from those that are much, much smarter and much more advanced than us. That's what I would like to see. Mm, beautiful. Well, thanks, uh, Rob, for coming on today. Thank you for being uh, for what you've done so far and for being a way shower for so many of us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great day today. And to those watching, hope you enjoyed today's interview. I'm your host, Mr. Great. More TV is coming up, and I'll see you guys next time. So take care, everyone. Hello everyone, this is Mr. Gray and thanks for watching today's episode. If you are an abductee, contactee or experiencer and you believe that your story could help others, please feel free to contact me through my YouTube channel email. When it comes to experiencers, the ET phenomena and the future, remember, truth will out.